George Carlin died of heart failure last night in Los Angeles. He was 71. During his 50 years in show business, he made 22 comedy albums, won four Grammy Awards, wrote books, and performed in many television shows. Yet it was stand-up, he says, that was the centerpiece of his life and helped him to interpret the world. Carlin was born in New York in 1937. He dropped out of high school, joined the Air Force, and later worked as a radio disc jockey while stationed in Louisiana. His stand-up career began a few years later, and he made his television debut on The Merv Griffin Show in 1965. In the early 70s, his work and persona took on an edgier tone. He emerged as a counterculture icon. He will be best remembered for his famous routine, Seven Words You Can Never Say on Television. The routine led to a landmark Supreme Court lawsuit that shaped decency rules for U.S. television and radio. He appeared on this program in 1996. Here is some of that conversation. How much difference, once you have it and once you're good, does delivery make from uh, night to night? It's everything. The pause, the inflection, yeah. the, the, the look, the bump. Yes. Um, it, that is the wonderful thing about the stand-up art, if we, yeah. can, if we can use that term. It is one of the few, it's the only one I know of, the only art form where the, the intended receiver of the art is present at the delivery and, and the art form can be altered according to their appreciation of it as you go. Mm. Now in my case I don't change the words a lot, but they give me signals that, that gives me license to do more with my body, to do more with my face and my voice. So except for a jazz musician who was also affected by his audience in an improv, uh, the, everyone else is separated from their audience by time or space or by mm -hmm. an arrangement or a key or a tempo. Not the comedian. He gets to do this according to how they appreciate him. And, and that's... Do we know, I mean, how far back does this art form go, this stand-up before well, a collection of people I, I would, saying, I, I'm here to entertain you? I have often Nothing said... Nothing more than my voice. I have often said... Uh, when, when people talk about, well, you know, you uh, may not like the system and everything, but uh, you make money from this and you're in business and all that. And sure. Uh, but I say, but you know, if, they, if, if, if I were forced to do this for free, I would. Yeah. If, if it were caveman days and I went from cave to cave yeah. telling my little stories in exchange, in exchange for a hunk of meat, I would yeah. do it. And if they said no meat tonight, I would still do yeah. the show. And I think storytellers and or shamans and oral traditionalists from primitive cultures probably are the forebears, the, the forerunners, I guess, of, of, of this art. And, and then monologists, although they didn't interact as much with their audience, the, the famous monologists of vaudeville and, yeah. and the, the Chautauqua circuit. Bob Hope was a hero of yours. Bob I, I Hope read in that the, somewhere. I well, don't know if he was Bob Hope in the movies. I never cared for his oh, television political monologue stuff. Why? Because it was too pat, too... Yeah, it was, too well, it was filtered through a commercial system. Yeah, right. We're selling right. trucks and, and tires yeah, right. here, folks, so we're going to filter things for you. But the movies never had that. At least it wasn't very visible. And I adored Danny Kaye. Yeah. And I, now think of me in the 40s. I'm about 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. And they're in their primes in the movies. And Bob Hope in the movies... Red Skelton in the movies and Danny Kaye in the movies. Were what? Were well, they were, they were something, because movies were larger than life. We didn't have television yet. It was a few years away. Radio was a big thing. But the movie, you sat there and the screen was so big and the theater was so big and it was this wonderful experience. And I said, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that. And I used to write to Sylvia Fine to try to get Danny Kaye's lyrics. I never got an answer. Yeah. I didn't know they were married. <laughs> and I said, dear Miss Fine, please send me a get, get, giddle. I want to learn this and do it yeah. at school and stuff. And I just loved the verbal facility. I knew, I said, this is something I want, I can do. And I didn't know what form mine would take, but I knew I could stand How about up. the Marx Brothers? Absolutely. Because of the chaos. Because they kicked over every bit of order. And the wonderful thing, they could go through a hotel lobby lighting a couch on fire, shooting the chandelier down, and the people only sort of looked slightly annoyed. No one panicked. No one called the police for this behavior. I loved that. Spike Jones on records, again, yeah. taking something ostensibly beautiful, breaking it down and destroying it in a way and making something else out of it, making chaos out of order and then order out of chaos. But when you knew you wanted to do this, was, the, I mean, was it any of the people I've just mentioned or was it someone else? that sort of spoke to you and you said, damn it, that's what I want to do. Well, it came first, I think, before I saw or heard any of them. My mother and father were very verbally gifted. I didn't know my father, but he was a, a top advertising salesman. He was the national advertising manager of the New York Sun. 
and a before that the New York Post when it was a broadsheet. Mm -hmm. My mother was an executive secretary in advertising all her life. They were very funny. Yeah. And I, I inherited that. And my mother used to get me to imitate people. Do you do you do Mae West? I didn't know Mae West, but I had I knew how to imitate yeah. her. Come up and see me. I did Johnny the Philip Morris Midget. And one day I said something to my mother. This was mimicry, pure imitations. Mm -hmm. But one day I said something to my mother, funny, and I knew the difference between her real laugh mm -hmm. and her social laugh. And I said something and I heard her real laugh. She really laughed at something yeah. I thought of in mm -hmm. my head. And I thought, wow. And wow. it just gave me a feeling of power. I don't remember what the thing was. But I knew I had made it up. But you can feel the same thing today. Yes. It's the same thing. It's, it, it's the capacity it, to know that an audience, whether you're making a speech or doing stand-up, right. that you can just feel them responding. I mean, the, it's yes. almost like it's Of course, the comic kinetic. has the laughter as, as proof right. every 5 to 10 or 15 seconds. And, and to know not only that, but the, the Arthur Kessler said in the act of creation that sometimes the jester can transverse Traverse, that's probably the word I want, traverse the triptych. And, and if the jester says something funny, well, he's a jester. If he says it in marvelous language that we, we say, oh, isn't that a nice way to put that? Then he's a bit of a poet. And if there's an underlying idea underneath the well-put funny line, if there's a bit of a philosophy in it, he becomes something else again, a philosopher. Now, one doesn't sit down and attempt to do that with everything he writes, yeah. but to know that that's part of the package, to know that you can do these three things in varying degrees. George Carlin, dead at 71.